Um, Catalonia society and entrepreneurship have a long tradition towards looking towards international markets and also in the area of innovation. As many of you might know, Barcelona is an international hub for startups. And at the same time, this orientation is paired with a strong commitment to help to solutions for the global challenges. Therefore, we have uh, also a clear commitment for the implementation of the Agenda 2030 SDGs. And we are very much aware that this, um, in times of pandemic and climate change, has to happen through public and private partnerships, that only together we can address successfully these kind of challenges. So today's event uh, wants to give the floor to actors from different areas and different sectors with different perspectives to discuss this public-private partnerships in innovating for the SDGs. And I would like to say a special thanks to uh, the Science Tech Diplo Hub Barcelona for the cooperation. And I also want to give a very warm welcome and a special thanks to all our speakers and moderators who are sharing their time and expertise with us today for this event. So thank you very much. And I'm giving the floor to Ms. Leimuller who will lead us to a, through a very surely interesting debate. Thank you very much, Ms. Schreiber. Uh, a very warm welcome also from my side to the audience today, this morning. We are targeting the really timely issue of sustainable development, reaching the sustainable development goals by multi-sided action. We have a lot of actors from the public sector, but also the private sector. Also new actors emerged during last years. And the interesting question is, how do we form new kinds of collaboration? So new forms of public-private partnerships. This term is already in the air since several decades. It's not a new term. It's about ecosystem creation right now, it would be a much more contemporary term, but I think it's still very valid to go across these boundaries and spheres of public and private at different levels. And what is also nice about this, uh, this discussion today, uh, we have a panel with three very distinguished and experienced actors from different levels of action and from different levels of context and organizations. Uh, and they bring to the table their experience, how we can form new partnerships here and how it could also work uh, to really not just say we do something together, but bring really action and momentum into this development and how to reach our very ambitious goal of sustainable development. What do we foresee for this hour? We want to start to introduce each of the panelists very briefly, six minutes, <laughs> six minute uh, talk, and then go into a joint discussion around this panel. And then we want to involve you uh, with your questions. And I really want to ask you already during the talk at the beginning, write your questions into the chat and then we, I'm sure we can pick it up uh, during our discussion. So please uh, don't hesitate to formulate already your questions right now. Yeah, with this, I think we are ready to learn more about our panelists. I want to start with David here. David Jensen from UNEP, uh, the United Nations Environmental Program. And in my take, he has a very unusual position because he brings digital transformation into this very established, big, complex organization. So it's like a little speed boat. Oftentimes, digital is very fast and this old tanker. Yeah. So, David, congratulations yeah. to this position um, as a digital transformation task force coordinator. The question I prepared for you is the following. How can the digital economy be really a major transformation vehicle in order to achieve the 2030 development agenda? 
which challenges should we look at and how do we bring together these different actors so for instance tech startups and the big big un organization Sure. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for, for being here. It's, it's a great pleasure and it's a great topic to be discussing. And as you said, having this kind of multi-level exchange. Um, as you mentioned, uh, UNEP has just adopted a new digital transformation program. And we're now um, you know, pushing digital transformation across the organization, but also across all of our partnerships and all the activities we're doing. And as you say, the, the digital economy is really the anchor uh, for this new program. And the question is really, you know, how do we embed sustainability data, metrics, values, norms into the algorithms and into the platforms and into the filters of the digital economy? So how do we hardwire sustainability into the digital economy and into those different uh, digital entry points? So I think that's the real, the real challenge. And I think if you, if you ask me sort of what are the grand challenges we have to solve in, in allowing the digital economy to accelerate sustainable development, I would say all of us need to be sort of thinking about four grand challenges. Um, the first grand challenge is really how do we influence consumer behaviors uh, towards sustainable products and services and sustainable lifestyles. So how do we use digital techniques to really um, encourage, incentivize, and help consumers take better sustainability choices? If you look at the data, about 50% of consumers want to be sustainable, but only 5% actually act in that manner, right? So how do we close that gap using digital tools and technology? So that's grand challenge number one. Um, and just to say that there are about 2 billion digital consumers that, you know, that is the total addressable market there. So it's huge, right? It's transformative. So how do we, how do, we do that? The number, this, the number two challenge is really looking at supply chains, global supply chains, and tracking and tracing uh, natural resources across those global supply chains, making sure that companies can really understand the environmental footprint, the carbon footprint of their products and services, um, looking at taking that footprint information and then um, helping communicate externally to consumers the performance of their products and services. So how do we make sense of global supply chains, monitor, track, trace, natural resources, environmental impacts, and communicate that to consumers. The third grand challenge is really about aligning capital to climate uh, and other environmental goals. At the moment, there's around $97 trillion of capital and only $1 trillion is, is environmental and socially and governance aligned. So there's a huge gap in terms of how money is flowing in the economy and what it's flowing to. So we really have to uh, align the, the, the flow of capital to achieve our goals and then the final thing we have to do, the final grand challenge, is really helping governments monitor progress against those global goals and against the, the multilateral environmental agreements. If you look uh, at the SDGs today that are environmental in nature, about 68% of those goals cannot be measured or monitored at a global level. So we've got this incredible framework, and yet we can't monitor progress, which, which is basically undermining, I would say, accountability. The other problem in that whole space, if you look at uh, multilateral environmental agreements, it takes about four to five years for every global assessment process to understand the, the state of affairs with respect to that convention. That's just far too long if we're trying to uh, you know, have a system of agile governance and policy. So helping governments monitor progress uh, to achieve our different goals is the fourth grand challenge. So I would say those are the four grand challenges we need to really focusing in on as we, as we look to uh, bring pub public and private sectors together. Thanks. Thank you, David. So I like your approach that you are uh, slicing this big challenge piece into these four chunks, as you mentioned them. So this consumer problem, the supply chain, financial flows, and also the monitoring by governments. Uh, I think UN is at a very interesting point in time where it tries to bring together this very agile startup environment with the big organizational level. Yeah? So how can I imagine that this really can happen and, and work? What are you doing actually? Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, the first thing we're trying to do uh, is, is within the Secretary General's Digital Cooperation Roadmap. You probably saw this was adopted last year. 
Um, we are carving out a new environmental track in that roadmap. It's called the, uh, the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability Codes. Uh, and the whole idea is we provide sort of a federating umbrella to bring together the large, the large actors, the SMEs, civil society, academia under a common tent. So at least we can begin to share information on what we're working on, uh, share lessons learned, and eventually move into uh, a dialogue around sort of what are the key digital standards that we need to sort of build up this digital ecosystem? And what's the sort of open side of that, those standards? What are the open source uh, elements of it? Uh, and what are the proprietary elements? And how do we sort of start bringing these together into this digital ecosystem? So this is, this is the first track that we're, we're moving in on is, is this big tent basically for people working on environment and, and digitalization. Um, and then the second thing we're doing at the moment is working with what's called the Internet Governance Forum, the IGF. The IGF is, is a key fora for discussing uh, internet policy and we're looking uh, to establish a new group within the IGF called the, the Policy Network for Environment and Digitalization. And in that context, the question is really, how do we harness the internet to become an important sort of digital standard for the flow of environmental data? So how do we use internet standards and the internet infrastructure to allow companies to share data, to allow people to access data, and to begin to, begin to harmonize data so we can actually um, aggregate it to a global level. At the moment, um, if you look at national reporting, it's, it's very difficult to aggregate. So by having a new set of internet standards, it's really focusing on environmental data and a new set of APIs that are focusing on environmental data. We hope to be able to aggregate that into a, a much more of a global view. So those are two things that we're taking forward right now. Yeah, sounds very interesting as a, as a no, or also the, uh, I think ESA is, is trying to establish a digital twin of the earth, you know, and you are establishing a kind of uh, a support infrastructure for monitoring and exchange of, of information flows on, envi and on envi environmental data. So that's very interesting because I think it can help a lot of actors on the ground to do their work. I think with on the, that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, David. With that, I want to go to our next speaker. So, uh, Merci Labordena is a senior policy advisor to Solar Power, Power Europe. Uh, Solar Power Europe is a very established organization, existing, I think you said, since three decades, yeah? And for you, you are facing a very different collaboration challenge with this, which is to work on the on the European level with European uh, Commission and other governmental bodies, uh, and definitely definitely try to really uh, shape things here. So, for instance, to reach the renewable energy goal, um, to increase this proportion of renewable energy by 32 percent by 2030. Uh, so how can in your take, in your experience, this private public partnership help on your level to move forward? Very good. Thanks, Ms. Lemula. Uh, so indeed, the European Union has a, a grand challenge in a very exciting one. And that is to move to become climate neutral by 2050. In a halfway um, by 2030, as you mentioned, we need to increase the share of renewable energy, not only by 32%, but now we are amid discussions to increase it to 38%, 40%, or even higher. So there's a lot of work to be done here. And how actually we are reach this climate neutral future? So one of the most um, cost-effective ways and most efficient ways is to um, electrify all the sectors of the economy as much as possible and electrify them with renewable energy, so climate neutral. But then there are always some sectors that are like hard to decarbonize, like um, heavy industry, like the chemical industry, cement. So for these sectors, maybe um, electrification is technically not viable or economically not very efficient. So for that, you have other options like renewable hydrogen. And then uh, to put all these systems together to keep our grid stable and strong, you need lots of storage. 
batteries. So actually, we have a here three elements. One is that uh, research shows that to reach a climate neutral future by 2050 with renewables, solar will reach about 60% of the share of the electricity needs. Then you will need renewable hydrogen to decarbonize these hard to abate sectors. And then you need lots of storage. So about 70% of the energy storage will come from batteries alone. Okay, so you have here, there is three elements, like three main pillars. So for the first one, for solar, there's a one already established the European um, Solar uh, Initiative, that actually the goal of this initiative is to reshape the manufacturing industry in Europe. Now, most of the manufacturing of the solar components is happening outside Europe, and we want to bring it another time here and make it our manufacturing industries stronger. And for that, um, Solar Power Europe has partnered with another uh, public and private um, actors to actually try to strengthen these uh, manufacturing and uh, actors all across Europe in the following years with the aim to create about uh, 40 um, euros, 40 billion euros of GDP increase annually in the coming years. And also that would lead to the creation of about 400,000 direct and indirect jobs. The second pillar is the one for renewable hydrogen. For that, uh, there's the um, Clean Hydrogen Alliance, also at European level. So that is being overseen by the European Commission. There are also uh, private actors included, private companies, and also um, is expected to have a high role from the public society. So Solar Power Europe is also involved in this alliance, uh, particularly in the, the role of, say, strengthening the generation of renewable hydrogen. We oversee one of those roundtables for the generation of clean hydrogen to make sure that sufficient generation will be available in the coming years to decarbonize these hard to abate industries. And for the second, uh, for the third pillar, the one of storage, actually we have also some recent nice examples in Spain uh, with uh, partners like Seat, Volkswagen, and also the energy company um, Iberdrola, with the support of the Spanish government to create a manufacturing industry for batteries. And it's very important also to focus on, on these components because if we are to electrify the transport sector, we need electric vehicles that needs, of course, batteries. So it's very good to actually plan ahead of the needs that we have of building up these electric vehicles, this fleet, and also uh, build up a manufacturing industry for the batteries. And that was a very recent example of a public-private uh, partnership that is being led by the Spanish government and also at more a regional level in Spain, there are other initiatives for creating similar um, industries. Thank you very much, Merci. I, I find this quite in, interesting that you used very concrete examples, yeah, like hydrogen or other battery thing. Um, and it's also interesting which, which part plays an association being an umbrella for, I think, more than 200 uh, companies investing in solar. So in being in this intermediary position between public and private, this is an interesting spot to be there. And probably later in the discussion, we can uh, uh, come back to the question, which, which role is this exactly? Yeah? Do you kickstart things or are you pressed by your members to do something <laughs> or is the commission approaching you? you know? very interesting how uh, to think about it. Right. Thank you very much for the moment. So we go over to Alexis. Alexis Roik, I hope I have spoken it in a, in a right way. Is it right. Roik? We say right in Catalan. Yeah. Sorry for that. I'm not a Spanish speaker, unfortunately. Uh, Alexis, and with the pre-name, it's, it's much easier. Uh, you are the CEO of the Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub in Barcelona. Uh, it's a very new organization, so to say, with three years in life. Uh, and this is a very interesting, I think, case study 
which role cities can play in this whole sustainability uh, movement. Uh, can you explain us a little bit why this could be a model for the future for other cities to move forward? Sure, definitely. Well, thank you so much, so much, Miss uh, Les Mueller. I also hope that I can pronounce it properly your, your name in German. And I'm happy to share the stage today, the floor with, with uh, so, so, so many uh, uh, really professionals in, in the field of public private partnerships for the, for the SDGs. So yeah, as you were mentioning, cities um, or urban ecosystems are increasingly recognized as, as a pivotal to, to many multilateral agendas, including those driving uh, sustainable development. And, and this global recognition of the centrality of, of, of the urban world in global affairs has in the past few years become tangible uh, from a dedicated SDG on cities, for example, like SDG 17, to spotlight role in, in, in climate action in the post, post Paris Agreement roadmap of climate change, to disaster response, financing development, and not least a dedicated uh, UN uh, new urban agenda. So in the last decades, an increasing number of cities have been defining these strategies for international action and defining mechanisms to, 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 to ensure an integral approach to the different global agendas and particularly sustainable development through an effective coordination among the different levels of government, but also with the various stakeholders operating in the city, especially or particularly through public-private partnerships. And in all these cases, science and technology and, and technology also innovation emerge as the cornerstone of, of public policies to provide specific uh, global and shared solutions with other cities and urban areas. So following this idea and taking advantage of its scientific strengths, in 2018, Barcelona's knowledge and innovation ecosystem came together to launch a comprehensive diplomatic strategy to put the city's science and technology at the forefront of sustainable development and, and global challenges. So this is how SciTech Diplo Hub, the Barcelona Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub, was, to, was created as a non-profit public-private partnership backed by the city's main research centers, universities, non-profits, uh, government institutions at the local and regional level, um, together with companies and startups to position Barcelona as a global laboratory in science diplomacy for cities around the world and make Barcelona a more influential player on the global stage by, by, by representing its knowledge and innovation ecosystem in all sorts of international fora where global challenges are, are, are discussed. So both the global commitment to sustainable development and the localization of the SDGs lie at the core of Barcelona science diplomacy. And we aim to order uh, a meaningful interaction between scientific knowledge and both global and local policy support in the implementation of, of the SDG. So just to give you a, a few tangible specific examples of how we have been advancing in, in, in terms of sustainable development through this city-led science diplomacy. For instance, last year in 2020, uh, Barcelona Science and Technology and Innovation Ecosystem became the first ecosystem to be recognized as a member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network which is a, 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 a network set up a few years ago under the auspices of the UN Secretary General. So through this network, we mobilized Barcelona scientific and technological expertise to promote uh, practical solutions for the implementation of the SDGs and the Paris, Paris Climate Agreement. And so others can benefit from our know-how know generated uh, in Barcelona's universities and, and research centers, as well as knowledge intensive companies. We also, for example, joined the Planetary Health Alliance, which is a Harvard University initiative to where we represent Barcelona's science and technology ecosystem and its efforts to address global environmental change and its health impacts. Um, we are also very actively engaged in the International Network for Government Science Advice. This is an affiliated body of the International Science Council, which provides a forum for policymakers, um, practitioners, academies, and academics to share experiences, build capacity, and practical approaches to use scientific evidence into informing policy at all levels of government, so also local. And this is really relevant when we talk about achieving the SDGs. I and mean, it's nice to have uh, seven. Uh, colorful logos, but I mean, you need to, 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 to track this through, through uh, evidence uh, and, and, and informed policy. So I'm also just to, to share a couple more of examples. Uh, the year before in 2019, cited people have also represented Barcelona's ecosystem and its central role in tackling climate, climate change at the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP25, and was the first city invited at the UNESCO World Science Forum to discuss the contribution of how the city-led science diplomacy strategy driven by a public-private partnership can be an effective tool for, for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. I think a very interesting example and, and quite new from the approach that you are by purpose bridging these structural holes between the different uh, levels of action and actors, of course. Yeah, 
uh, I like your also your examples very much. Uh, perhaps a question to all of the three panelists is right now what what are the specific uh, success criteria or success factors in your experience to enable this very heterogeneous collaboration? Uh, and we also have a question of, of Saskia in our audience uh, towards this. So for instance, public uh, sector actors might feel be impressed by the private actors who often have a very clear interest and a fast pace. Yeah? Uh, and there are different uh, speeds, uh, there are different interests. So there might be sometimes in practical terms, a lot of tension in this collaboration. It's not that easy uh, as it is said to do it in practic practical ways. So might you uh, reflect a little bit on, on this? What is your experience? What is, what is a success factor for PPPs when you look back on the project you are supporting or initiate, initiating it in. I'd be happy to start. Um, we have some tremendous partnerships with a number of technology firms, Google, Planet, uh, IQ Air, IBM, Facebook. And, and I agree that um, at the outset, uh, there is uh, uncertainty of intent of your partner on both sides. And I think um, that's, you know, that's, that, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, from, from my side, the key thing for us is understanding what's the business model that's driving the actual partnership. Um, is it an ad revenue model? What, you know, is it a subscription model? What, what's the actual source of funding for the private sector side? Because once you understand the source of funding, you can also then understand sort of the incentive structure a bit better and what the longer term intent is. So I think transparency around the business model that's financing the public-private partnership uh, is, is essential. Um, and so you mean transparency around the business model of the PPP, but also of the individual actor? Correct, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Understanding what the business model is of the actor that you're working with is from our perspective, from the UN perspective, mm -hmm. understanding that business model. I think the second thing is moving much more into an agile mindset for partnerships. Uh, I think, you know, in, in, maybe in previous times, partnerships were inked for five years or longer. Nowadays, we're moving much more into agile partnerships, you know, year-long partnerships that we can easily move out of if, if, if we're not happy with the terms and conditions as they evolve. So we need to be thinking more of agility and, and um, you know, partnerships are as good as long as they're meeting our shared interests. And the moment they're not meeting our shared interests, we can we can depart. So trying not to become too dependent on these partnerships and making sure that we have an agile approach to them. I think the other thing is obviously starting small and starting with a very clear use case, um, building the trust around a small use case and then expanding the partnership out over time. That's, that's a, fa a fairly standard one. And I think the other, the final one is really um, getting, a, getting a clarity on the data that the partnership is generating and really understanding what will be the sort of digital public goods coming out of the partnership and how will the data be managed in, in particular coming out of that partnership if there's a data element to it. Um, those are where we've seen sort of the most surprises in terms of what's, what's being done with the data. And I think the key thing about the data, if it's public data coming out of a platform, it has to be interoperable and managed as a digital public good. I think the, the worry right now is you have many of these cloud platforms that are starting to sort of create their own ecosystems of environmental data, but not necessarily sharing across ecosystems very well. Um, and I think we want to avoid that. So making sure that Google and, and Microsoft and Amazon and all the big cloud providers can interoperate environmental data across their clouds and anything they generate has to be a digital public good. Those are some of the things that I would, I would say from the outset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these were already very interesting points. So, Merci, do you want to continue? Thanks. I'm actually going to give a quite practical advice <laughs> from our experience uh, with the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. The, that is coordinated at a higher level by the European Commission. So the European Commission sets the agenda for hydrogen. And last July, we had the EU hydrogen strategy with clear objectives at mid and also longer term. 
But then how we actually can oper operationalize all of that? How can we make that a reality? And that where is the role of these alliances and partnerships come up. So on one side, we have the overarching, say, hand of the European Commission, but then on the other side, we have dozens of private companies and also um, trade associations, industrial associations, with uh, playing also um, a game there to reach these objectives. And there are a lot of actors being involved, all of them with, with a very similar objective, but anyhow, that's very difficult to work with all that high number of factors. So my practical advice is actually to um, a contract a facilitator, to really ask a, a body that facilitates all these dialogues and all these discussions, a body that is really informed about the topic, that knows what they are doing, what they are talking about, and really that is capable to talk to all the different actors in their different languages, in their different technical languages. And because of that, with a, a specific role of a facilitator, that will make the, the job of reaching those objectives much, much easier. It's, it's unbelievable. So my practical advice is actually uh, get hold of a, a consultancy of, of someone that actually helps you to smooth the process to reach these goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is really something uh, a lot of actors can can take into into their recipe book, uh, because having a neutral facilitator uh, who is capable of, of doing these translations and this interaction and initiating also critical discussions sometimes also, uh, you know, uh, dealing with conflict or, or raising the voice if, if a critical issue emerges. Probably it's very valuable to have someone who can take this role and is not a party automatically in the in the construct in the whole um, uh, consortium. So probably you were speaking also about your experience uh, as a senior policy advisor. You also, I guess, have to bridge these different sides sometimes, isn't it? Yes, and that's why it's not always easy. So as I mentioned, you really need to understand each other's languages, you know, to mm -hmm. put yourself in their shoes. And uh, you need a lot of different brains. It's like, you really need to, to understand what are their needs and also to make, to fulfill those needs very fast mm -hmm. because we have mm -hmm. an agenda. And that yeah. agenda is not to be, I don't know, to be materialized in say 10 years or 15 years the European Commission wants things to happen in the coming months, but that should happen fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very important to bring an external actor to speed up the things. And I can imagine it would be uh, of advantage to have someone in person who, who knows uh, both sides or all the three sides of the table, or who probably changed job over his career or her career uh, and knows how is the government working, or how is the EU working internally, but also probably how is the company working. Or? Correct. Yeah, otherwise we always have, you know, this prejudice in, in our heads and we imagine something, but it, it's very different in the real world. Always. <laughs> yeah, always, yeah, uh, uh, Alexis. What is your advice? So you, you built from scratch three years ago this organization with a, a very kind of new mission, yeah? a new role to fulfill. Yeah? What's your success, uh, success recipe to work across these different boundaries? Calling it success recipe is going to be pretentious. <laughs> but well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we obviously we benefit from the fact of having this like very diverse set uh, sort of like series of institutions in our organization, both public and private. But at the same time, this comes with a lot of, of challenges, many of them like the ones that David and Marseille were, were, were mentioning. So I would start by saying that establishing an inclusive uh, dialogue uh, among the stakeholders to be involved in. In, in, a, in a PPP or in our case, in a city's sustainable development strategy or science development strategy is the first key ingredient for a, for a fruitful collaboration. And in our case, at Site Technical Hub, we, we start with ourselves as a bridge linking together the wide array of stakeholders 
that is comprising Barcelona's innovation ecosystem with the purpose of representing its assets and its interest in different global agendas and, and contributing to its coordination. So as you can imagine, the, the priorities of each one of the, of, of the stakeholders might vary quite a lot. So uh, scientific people have emerged as an institutionalized public-private partnership that serves as the pillar structure when, when where public and private stakeholders in Barcelona's innovation ecosystem share and align their interests and missions, thereby converging into the implementation of its science diplomacy strategy and contributing to, to, to project the city abroad and, and to, to make commitment to our involvement to sustainable development. But of course, one of the main challenges is the alignment of interest between stakeholders. So therefore, uh, I would say that a great effort was, was put on establishing communication channel, challenges, um, channels sorry, uh, among all actors with the objective of allowing them to get acquainted with, with each other. So when the stakeholders have a certain knowledge about their respective interests and, and, and also conflict of interest, synergies can be more easily enhanced and a shared global vision can be, can be, can be designed. Uh, so communication on a regular basis facilitates the exchange of ideas, the exchange of information and perspectives, as well as the mutual understanding of roles and responsibilities to ensure a, a more efficient decision-making process. Because I mean, when we have a, when you have a cooperation, a collaboration, a public private partnership, you, you need some governance, you need some rules to, 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 to decide how this decision-making is, is, is going to work. And this is quite challenging. And that's, that's why this uh, communication and, uh, and also I would call it empathy uh, from, from one organization to, to another, uh, to, to be able to, to be in, in the other's organization's shoes, to understand their perspectives is, is, is essential. Actually, uh, here at people have some, some, sometimes we joke, like saying like we, we, we might be doing science diplomacy or city diplomacy abroad, but we do as much internal diplomacy with the different stakeholders here in Barcelona and, and Catalonia, because we, we, we put people in the same table that usually they don't talk to each other or that they have like, they work independently. So, I mean, there's like a lot of effort in, in, in in, in this direction. And I agree with David uh, about transparency. I mean, a transparent process uh, might contribute to uh, a broader support for the project under development and, and set the ground for building mutual trust among the, the different in, in involved partners. So I think this is this is fundamental. And looking back in time, um, I, I would say that Barcelona City led science diplomacy has not only reinforced the international influence of, of, of Barcelona's innovation ecosystem, but also favored the internal interaction between its main actors by, by delimiting the international action of each one of the stakeholders and making sure who was doing what and also improving the criteria to prioritize which actions uh, the ecosystem was was, was uh, taking in, in terms of like in this case uh, the city strategy in, 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 in sustainable development so i do believe just like to, to, to summarize that uh, multi-level and cross-sector governance relationships are, are critical for the integration of in this case local initiatives that, that, that try to operate in, 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 in global systems, like for example, the agenda 2030 or any other like global agenda. And I think that the case of Barcelona paves the way for other global innovation ecosystems to explore the opportunities of building public-private partnerships to, to, to implement a city-led science diplomacy as a formal institutionalized practice aimed to reinforce the interest of, of, of local interest in the international scene. So despite all the challenges that we went through and that we have ahead, I do believe that the case of Barcelona is a very unique best practice of public-private cooperation and innovation for, for the SDGs. Can I ask a follow-up question to, to Alex? Yeah. Uh, yes, sorry, please. I like this. I think the biggest challenge that we face right now uh, is you've got, you've got a, a massive global decentralized distributed network of actors that want to work in this space, right? You know, there's SMEs, there's big corporates, there's civil society, there's academia. From our side, it's just hundreds of thousands of actors that, that, that want to work collectively, collaboratively. And what we lack is kind of a mechanism to broker coordination between that group, like mapping it and helping to coordinate or facilitate the coordination across it. Have you seen a platform or what's your advice in terms of simply mapping that ecosystem and helping everybody sort of understand the moving parts and, and doing kind of the matchmaking between the different parts of that ecosystem that need to be match made. What's your advice or what's your experience there? Well, in, in our case, we, we first of all we we, we always have a, a, like a recurrent discussion about what ecosystem what an ecosystem is or like where are the boundaries of an ecosystem because I mean it's, it's difficult to say because then you start including companies, universities, and other institutions, so like it's limitless almost. 
but yeah, uh, this on the one side. And then uh, regarding this, this broker rate of information or who does, who does what and so on, obviously it's much easier if you have like a smaller, like a smaller cluster or a smaller uh, uh, ecosystem. In our case, we, we are mainly in a, in a local or metropolitan scale. Um, what we also do is like try to, to, to add some layers there. So for example, uh, we cannot deal with each individual startup or, 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 or company, but, that, but then there are like associations of startups, they're like business unions. So we try to channel what we do, uh, for example, with the private sector through these organizations. And I guess that, that's also what probably Marte might be involved uh, at her organization. So, uh, well, that's, that's one of the things we do. And then of course there are like digital platforms that can help people to, to, to share knowledge and so on. The, the, the challenge with this, because we have tried this in, in the past, is like, okay, you might have the tool, but if nobody's gonna use it or people are gonna nurture the tool with the information, it, 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 it's useless. And we are all like in so many platforms and keeping the information updated in different platforms is like very costly time wise. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with you that this is a challenge and I do not have like a, a, a perfect solution for that, which is like, we've been working this way so far. Mm -hmm. I had a question from David. How do you work uh, practically in a digital space with so many actors? Is there a tool also over to Merci? Robbie, you have more than 200 member organizations. Huh? Do you have an advice for David here? So what's the advice that David needs? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, David, do you want to reframe your question probably for Messi? She has a similar challenge, but probably not so many actors than you are seeing. I'm looking for a killer application or a killer tool <laughs> that helps me map out a digital ecosystem and keep that information up to date uh, so that people can understand who are the actors in the ecosystem, what are the services that are being provided? What are the gaps and how do we begin to match make um, those different actors? And um, as, Mar as, sorry, as Alex has said, this information goes out of date instantaneously, pretty much. It's really hard to keep it updated. So there has to be an automated way or there has to be a, a much more uh, efficient way of having those stakeholders themselves keep that information updated. But of course we need incentives to do that. So I'm just looking for you know, if you look, if you put yourself in my situation, global organization trying to match make thousands and thousands of actors, how do we do it effectively? Like, what's the role we can play to do that effective coordination and brokering? Uh, first of all, uh, so Arpa, we, we don't have like a, a digital tool to do the mapping in the sense that, yes, we are in touch with these more than 200 uh, private companies, also with all the national associations across Europe and also beyond. And we do that more like in a, you know, one-to-one -one basis. Also because doing that, you build uh, personal relationships with them. And here in this space, that is crucial. So you actually need to know the person uh, at the other side to really understand what they need and what they want. And only by building this relationship with this personal relationship, you actually uh, go like walk together. Now, we also have at Solar Power Europe, what is called resource, the resource platform, which is the European Alliance of Corporate Buyers and Sellers of Renewable Electricity. And for that, we have an annual event for matchmaking. So for this one, we uh, gather both buyers and sellers of renewables uh, into one in a digital platform and second uh, physically in rooms to, to talk to each other as well. So first of all, we have done this exercise of contacting these partners proactively or not to really upload their information in this uh, matchmaking platform and then make sure that in the day of the uh, physical gathering uh, everything is set up and they talk to each other and we enable these conversations. So for us, that's a mix of a, a first, like a, a, the use of a digital platform, like a first step, but then for us it's crucial to have like one-to-one -one conversations because it's really when, when businesses takes place. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting advice because you ask for a digital solution and Merce said combine it combine it with real life events somehow. 
Uh, and now we are in the COVID-19 situation where we cannot have these events anymore. So the question is in the future, is it even digital? Yeah. And can we keep such a, as you said, David, such a platform alive over time, even without seeing each other for a longer time? Yeah. So probably we need really even more digital solutions. Yeah. But I can follow you quite well, Merci. We also build up uh, networks, huge networks, where we oftentimes combine digital with, with real life events in order to also create really strong social ties between people uh, and bring that to the digital world or vice versa. Yeah? But I, I admit it's different right now. And probably even on the scale of the UN, you have to think differently because you have so many actors and you don't know when you could uh, organize events on the ground anymore. Well, that's exactly, well, that's, the problem is a scale problem. I love, I love the idea of individual touch points with this whole ecosystem, but at a scale of 100,000 actors, it's impossible. So how do we broker, the question is, how do we broker those touch points between those actors so it happens organically rather than us having to facilitate? So I, it, the platform doesn't exist, but I'm just wondering what's out there uh, in the digital space. Because if we're going to basically ever achieve the SDGs at a global level, we're going to have to federate a whole series of activities and put them under an umbrella where they're all pushing to, to solve one of these grand challenges. And my question is, how do, what's, the digital, what's the digital fabric or digital mesh that allows that to happen so it does channel up to that global level? But I think it doesn't exist. I think we're all sort of looking for the same solution. But I appreciate your advice. Yeah, and I hand this question also over to our audience. Probably someone in, a, in the chat can write an answer and we pick that up here in the panel discussion. And saying that, uh, please write your questions into the chat. Yeah, we still have a few minutes, not too many, uh, to discuss us about it. Saskia had, an, had another question. I want to use this uh, and, and give it to the panel. So would you say that PPP is an especially effective for smaller projects? So she's currently working in a PPP project with 36 partners involving more than 350 people in a consortium. So, uh, I would... so it's difficult to, to manage that. What's your advice, Robby? How could you uh, yeah, govern such a PPP? I think what, what she said is exactly right. Sm smaller is better in the PPP space. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine how you would govern that uh, with 36 partners, frankly, and 350. I think that, that sounds like a governance nightmare. Um, the, the PPPs that we generally work on are much, are much smaller with only a couple of partners, you know, maximum five or six. As you say, because the governance is usually what either makes or breaks it. Um, and um, I, I, don't think we, I don't think we yet have digital governance norms for these kind of, you know, massive scale partnerships. Um, so thinking through that, I mean, I think they're possible to do, but we're still stuck in kind of analog governance. And um, I think governance ha itself hasn't moved into the digital space yet. So at the moment, I don't have a solution. I would say smaller is better for sure, because that, that gives me a headache right there just by looking at those numbers. But I think, you know, going forward, maybe those will be necessary to have those kind of that to get scale, you're going to have to have those big partnerships, but then you need a, a digital governance framework that can keep pace with that. And uh, ideas would be welcome for, for how to do that. Isn't the major difference also if you if you look at the level playing field network? Yeah, it's probably better to, to have a smaller partnership. But if you want to scale it, you need more hierarchy. Well, the, the problem is pa the power. It's the power dynamic in a partnership that large. Not all actors have equal power if you've got 350 people. And so in a governance framework, it's very hard to give, I think it's very hard to give all actors similar power. If you've got a Google and an, and an SME, giving them equal power in that is very difficult. So you, you, you've, got to, you've got to think through that kind of power relationship and power dynamic as you structure these. And I think in that context, yeah, that, that, that's another reason why sometimes smaller is better because the power asymmetry between the partners is much less. You can have a PPP with SMEs, you can have a PPP with, with tech titans, and at least in that context, the power dynamics will be differentiated by the partnership and not mixed together. 
So I think, yeah, I, I think this is a great, this is a great question and a, and a great area for innovation, digitalized governance of PPPs. Mm -hmm. Merci, do you want to add something? Because you have a very different kind of partnership, probably, is smaller better? You're asking me? Yeah, both of you, Alexis and Merci. I mean, uh, I do agree, like, I mean, if actually we're talking about human relationships. So obviously, if you keep it at the, at the scale that our brain was designed to work, it, it, it's, it's much easier. I mean, it's not natural for us as human to have to, to have to discuss with 300 people at the same time to make a decision. So obviously, smaller is 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 is, is better in this sense. But um, I would say, like, uh, trying to add on what David was saying, like, well, I have Google in this partnership, but then I also have the SME, and there's this like this disparity of power. Well, sometimes I mean, this is an extreme example, but Sometimes you have all the, several members in the PPP, but that not all of them might be as committed to the project as the others. And, and maybe you want to leverage this fact. So if there are like some ones that want to lead or like push forward uh, the project to, to, to a further level, uh, let, let's give them some, some room for this, right? Uh, so, well, in this sense, I do not think that, that moving into the digital world is such a challenge, but I don't think neither that there is going to be any solution for digital governance for that, because at the end of the day, the problem is the same, like finding consensus, uh, building relationships. So, well, you can do that through Zoom as well, in the same way you, you were doing maybe um, offline. So um, I don't think that this about one tool or it's about the methodology. And this could be also the, the problem or the solution when, 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 when in the offline world. In our case, inside Tech People Hub, uh, our board is like about uh, over 20 institutions, but many of them representing over 1,000 institutions inside of, of, of them. So uh, at the end, if you, if you keep like scaling or like going down in the pyramid, we also have like uh, thousands of stakeholders. Uh, and already managing about 20 members of the PPP uh, with like very diverse, like a huge diversity of sizes, uh, economic power and, and nature of what they do because you have a university, then you have a city council, and then you have, a, I don't know, like a, a ministry of the Catalan government, and then you have a network of, of tech startups. So and their interest and then their priorities and the way they might understand the project may be completely, completely, completely different. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would go back to some of the recommendations that both the David and Marseille were, 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 were giving earlier, like uh, communication, facilitation, this is still key. So what, what I hear also here is that you have to think about the structure behind, that you look a little bit kind forming a tree with branches, you know, and not working with each individual actor probably, but, but how to, to bring them into, into collaboration on their own level and then handle probably a representative or an association of these, yeah? So it's also about the kind of real world structure behind that in order to bring it in a, in a fruitful form in a digital world and enhance collaboration in a digital world. Merci, do you have a different take on this? What's your experience here? I have the exact same take. So the smaller, the better. <laughs> that will make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and indeed, so not all the stakeholders are engaged in, in the similar way. Mm -hmm. So it's very important also to leverage that. So if you need to, to communicate something in the sense of organizing meetings, you know, just to align on positions, uh, maybe you can think about organizing, I don't know, every month, uh, meeting with uh, a number of stakeholders, the ones that are, say, the, the, the most engaged, and then, like, most space in time, maybe three months or something, then consider, like, larger audiences. So if you need feedback quite soon and fast on very important topics, then it may be more important to leverage these stakeholders that may have, like, a certain uh, power in the decision-making process, and also they are, are very active in all these uh, consortium. And then you always have um, actors that they may not feel that they need to be that involved, but of course their voice is also important. So maybe uh, the way is to uh, communicate with, with them, to gather them in a 
the same round table, but in another time space, you know, maybe not that frequent, but maybe more space in time. Just to work around automation on these three structure. That's where it will put. Can I just add one more quick point before we wrap? I think there, there, are, there are two platforms I've seen that kind of to speak, to start to speak to this issue. One is called polis.is, uh, P-O-L dot I-S, which is, is, which is a, a, a decision-making platform, a consensus building platform used in uh, Taiwan, where you can basically uh, get a sense of public perception around certain issues and move people uh, towards a shared decision um, in, an, in an online uh, format. And I think that's worth looking at to see how that could work. I think that works when people don't know each other and when there's sort of a massive crowd level input needed to make sense of. I think the other one that's interesting is, is Lumio, um, where you have basically like asynchronous decision-making capabilities uh, of people that tend to know each other already. So where, where you have a federation and you need to take a series of decisions, Lumio can be a platform to, to do that. So I think there are two that I've seen that maybe have some potential. But as you say, I think we need to figure out in these new governance frameworks, what are the synchronous decisions we have to take together where we all have to be online together and what are the asynchronous ones and how do you, what's the cadence between sort of synchronous and asynchronous and how do you stick, match those together? And then how do you cr create a framework that allows the engaged ones to sort of lean in as much as possible, but doesn't exclude the other ones? Right. Uh, yeah, all, all these challenges, yeah, anyway. Yeah, in my experience as an open innovation expert, I also have seen that, you know, bringing specific resources in a, such a, a platform, by, for instance, uh, starting a challenge, uh, giving a prize to some people, you know, can help to build momentum. So resources can have different formats, I guess. Yeah, but I learned from social network theorists that uh, networks don't uh, stay alive by themselves. It has to do something with resource flows also. So probably the question is also not only to do consultation and consensus building on certain issues, but also to probably create new alliances, new projects by little things or by framing a challenge. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my advice I could give to this point. So looking at the time, we should and I think our panel in order to be in time. So, so probably my question to you is, we are in a very special time right now. On the one side, we, we have this pandemic, this global pandemic. Uh, on the other side, we have a lot of momentum, which was created before the pandemic, but also was created now. A lot of people think about change. A lot of people are ready to change how they work and life. So what is your one biggest hope looking ahead into the coming months? Just uh, 20 seconds. Could be also a very personal answer. The, 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 the top priority and then uh, I would say like the main hope now is like we get rid of the virus and we get uh, the whole country, the whole world vaccinated. And I think that this is a success. This is yet one perfect case study of innovation for a global challenge where we had a public-private collaboration to develop in just one year. This few, so far we have like a few have approved, but we're going to have probably around a hundred vaccines in, in one two years. So I guess it is a it is a, a big success of a PPP for a global challenge, and and I do hope that we will see the, the all, all the consequences of this in the upcoming months. Thank you, Alexis. Our next event in a face-to-face -face format. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution. It's a very nice connection you made now. And actually, I would build on that in saying that um, as a result of the COVID crisis, we are now have the recovery funds coming from the Commission. And all the member states, they can have uh, these funds to build back better, to build their economies greener and stronger. So. I think that they need to grab this opportunity and to really build um, local, uh, not only manufacturing, but also local industries focused on green jobs. Thank you very much. I hope. Uh, uh, 
they, they pick it up what you said and a lot is happening here. David. And I can build on that. I fully agree. I love the idea of using the recovery funds uh, to close the digital divide. I think half the planet still remains disconnected from the internet. Um, so that digital divide needs to be closed. But while closing it, we need to make sure we don't cause further environmental problems, right? With respect to e-waste, energy, uh, supply chain impacts. I mean, there's a whole host of issues. So it's closing the digital divide and um, accelerating digital transformation in an environmentally sound way. And there will be a debate uh, in the General Assembly on this question on the 27th of April, um, how to do this, how to close the divide, but not create further negative uh, social and environmental impacts. So I would say uh, engage in the debate and uh, make your voice heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank to all of you. Thank you to the organizers of this very interesting panel on PPPs and the sustain uh, sustainability. Uh, I learned a lot, I think, today. It, it's really about bringing digital and analogous world together. It's about bringing different actors together. Sometimes small is beautiful, but not always. <laughs> we have also faced the challenge to, to coordinate big group of actors, even thousands of actors. Yeah, uh, But there's a lot going on, and it's definitely possible to work across these boundaries and also manage the differences between these actors. This gives hope, I think, to the world and, and brings us innovation towards sustainability. Thank you very much to the audience also here. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you can also uh, bring a lot into practice which you learned today. Please look also at the chat. There were a lot of interesting links posted here. Thank you very much and hope to see you at another occasion soon. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.